Good evening, Pastor Gene Oller here, Word of Hope Church, Kentucky. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us tonight. Uh, I tell you, God is so good. I'm going to preach a message out of Psalms 121. God is our helper. He's our deliverer. He preserves us from all evil. Our God is a big God. But I want to say a couple of things before we do that. Uh, just some statements, uh, things I think about and uh, look through the scriptures about. The uh, first thing I want to say is, is God is a sovereign God and God can do anything he wants to do. But God in his sovereignty has chosen to give us promises, uh, conditions, uh, teachings in the word of God, and he never violates his own word. So even though God can do what he wants, he's given us his word so we could know what to expect of him. And so the sovereignty of God revealed in his word teaches us who he is. And we find out that he's a wonderful father. A statement we make a lot is God is good. And then sometimes people say good all the time. And of course the song, God is good. But to many people, God is good in an abstract sort of way. He does evil things. And then when we cry out, then he does good things. He does evil things, and then he delivers to show how powerful he is. But you know Jesus, who was the express image of the Heavenly Father, when he was on the earth, he didn't hurt people and then heal them. He didn't treat people bad and then forgive them. He loved people, and he demonstrated his Father. And I think some people think some way that Jesus came and he went around doing good healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil, that he was undoing the works of his father. But Jesus said, everything I do and say is the work of my father. So God is good, and he is good all the time, and he's not good in some abstract, hard-to-figure-out way. God is just simply good. Now, God is uh, a favorite saying of mine, is God wants to be your father. That's who God wants to be to everybody. He's always looking for children. You're not automatically a child of God because you're born in this world. Jesus said you weren't. He said if you're, if you're Heavenly Father, we don't have the same Father that he has. We had a different Father. He told the scribes and Pharisees their Father was the devil. And so when we get born again, Jesus becomes our heir, our, our joint heir, our brother, and the Heavenly Father becomes our Father. And so... Uh, God is a, he, he, he's a wonderful father and he wants to be a father, but if he has to be, he'll be a judge. That's up to you and me. If we choose God, then he's our heavenly father and he takes good care of us. If we reject God and don't obey the Lord and walk in our own ways, then he will and we'll be held accountable for those choices. And so God is a great father, but he'll be a judge if he has to be. And, uh, you know, the mystery of God. Sometimes people talk, well, God is so mysterious, or so filled with mystery, and that's true. God is far too big for me to figure out. But in his word, he has revealed everything that we need to know for life and godliness in this world. So the mystery of God is incredible. But God has chosen to reveal much of who he is for this time for us so that we can know who he is through through his word and the revelation of the Holy Spirit and through the life that Jesus lived. So those are just a few thoughts, things that I think we need to consider sometimes. God is a good God. And he's a good God in good ways all the time. He's sovereign, can do anything that he wants to do, but he's chosen uh, to give us his word so we would know what he would do. And God wants to be your father but if you won't let him be your father, he will be your judge. And that's the choice we make. If you would, turn to Psalms 121 if you want to, or just follow along with me. And let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your incredible holy word. Lord, it's in the pages of this book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. As men of old wrote the things that you gave them, that's where we learn about you. That's where we learn truth. Jesus said that his word was truth. And Lord, in the Old Testament, the scripture says that your word, God, is truth. And Lord, this is truth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the truth of your word will abide forever. We thank you, Lord, for one thing in this world 
that is non-compromising, that's unshakable, that will stand the test of time. And it is not our buildings, our power, our government, or our might, but it is your word, Jesus said, would stand when everything else fell. So, Lord, in the shaky times of what we see in our world today, we cling to the rock. We come and stand upon the written promises in your word. Lord, we look to you in this time. We thank you, Father. We ask for your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Psalms uh, 121. We want to read here. And this is David uh, writing. And David says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. David said, I'm going to look up to find my help. Where are you looking today for help? You know, by looking up, David was saying, I I'm looking to God. Uh, are you looking to God or are you looking for the resources of, of man and the government, the ability of others? Maybe you look to yourself when you get in trouble and you say, well, I can do it myself. I can figure it out. And you know, some things we can do, but we need to learn to trust God. And uh, so when you and I are driving down a road, and I don't know if you've ever done this. I did this particularly when I rode motorcycles. If I got to watching something off to the right, my motorcycle would begin to drift to the right. And I would look up and have to correct my course. You see, what we look at, what we are uh, focusing upon, uh, that gets our attention. And, and we begin to drift that direction. If you're problems, if you're focusing on the struggles that you're having and difficulties in your life, that'll have your attention. And if you're not careful, you'll be looking down all the time. You'll be looking at what's right in front of you instead of God that's above all, in all, and through all. David said when he was having trouble, and, and we can't go into it too much, but the psalm before was a psalm of God having trouble. And, and so these psalms are tied together. They're about David's life a lot of times. And what he experienced and you and I go through difficult times and I don't know uh, with the virus how that's affected you and what may be going on and maybe a job loss or struggles or depression anxieties or fears I tell you God wants to help you what you focus upon will have your thoughts and attention right now I'm looking down at the Word of God and I can see and read these scriptures because I'm focusing on the Bible but I can also see a room filled with chairs. I can see the back wall. I can see the projector system equipment. I can see Jack on the front row to the left. But what I'm really seeing clearly is the scriptures that my eyes are focused on. When you focus on your problems, you may have a peripheral vision of God. You may realize God is there somewhere. But David said, I look up. I look to the hills. I look to heaven. I look above for my help. That's where my help is going to come from. And when you focus on God, then the problems get smaller. When your focus is on the Lord, then you become aware of his ability to help and deliver you. And, and, and you can just stay uh, at peace. You can stay calm. Uh, you can rest in the Lord because you focus on him and not the problems. It isn't that we ignore problems or, or we think that problems are just going to go away. That's not trusting God. Trusting God is believing that God is able to bring a solution according to what he said in his word. And I'm going to put my hope and trust in what God has said in his word. The problems get bigger than God when we look at them. But when we look to God, the problems get smaller and smaller. It's very important to keep your focus on God. And you might say, well, how do I do that? Well, primarily in the word. You, you go to the word of God. You read its promises and and you weigh your problems against the promises of the Word of God, and you realize, my goodness, God's Word and His promises are far greater than the problems I face. David knew where his help came from. Many people trust in the help of man. Many trust in natural help, things that they can do in this life. But David had learned through faithfully serving the Lord as a boy shepherd. Uh, a lion came and took a lamb, and he went and killed the lion. A bear came and took a lamb and he went and killed the bear. And when he was just a little bit older, maybe 17, he rose up and fought against Goliath, a giant, and killed that giant. David had learned to look to God who could provide supernatural help and deliverance in difficult times. And right now, our world needs help and deliverance. I don't know a whole lot about the pandemic. I see some news. I read some articles. But, uh, 
you know, it is pretty serious. Some people say it's way worse than we think, and some people say it's not near as bad as we think. But either way, there are a lot of people uh, getting sick and dying. And uh, even though I don't know them personally, but uh, as of two weeks ago, 11 of the ministers in my association have passed away throughout the country. And I don't remember any other time that, that fellow ministers in my association uh, uh, died from the flu. So I think this is very serious. And, and, you know, during this time, we need to be looking to God. We need to be crying out to God. We need to be trusting the Lord. We need to be praying for others and praying for ourselves. Uh, doctors can do what they can do. Thank God for that. Uh, scientists might be able to find a shot or a pill or a cure. But God is our helper. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. Verse 2, David said boldly that his help came from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord, David said. The one you look to to help you is only as good or able to help you in relation to their own strength and abilities. You may trust somebody who has more means or more experience than you do, and, and they can help you to a point, but sooner or later, uh, they're going to come to a place maybe they can't help you anymore. But we can trust God to help us. And David tied these verses together. He said, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's who my helper is. Who's your helper today? My helper is the Lord who made heaven and earth. God invites you. He invites you. He calls out to you. He sent Jesus into this world to die for our sins, to restore a relationship between God and man. So we can say he's our Lord, he's our Father, he's our helper. He made heaven and earth, he's not limited. Man is very much limited. Verse 3 contains two more great promises, and then uh, even in verse 4, David goes into that again. But Verse 3 says this about the Lord. If you're trusting him, if your help's coming from God, if you're wholly trusting in Christ alone for his help and deliverance, he said he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel, and that would apply to the children of God today, uh, shall neither slumber nor sleep. The one who keeps you will not allow your foot to, strum, to stumble. Trusting the Lord puts us on solid ground where we will not lose footing. Jesus is the solid rock. You know, there's a, sing, a song that we sing in church, Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. Everything else that we trust in, my friend, is going to fall apart someday. But Christ will not be moved. He's the solid rock. We can cling to him. We can look up to that rock, that hill that is higher. Run to that rock when we're overwhelmed. And he can take care of us. Verse 3 also tells us a second promise. That not only is he that uh, mighty rock, that mighty fortress. He's that solid ground. He's the one that will not allow our foot to be uh, to stumble. In other words, we'll be uh, we'll have stability in life because we're standing on Jesus. But also, the one that keeps us does not slumber. He doesn't fall asleep. Uh, Chuck Smith says the Lord wants to keep you, but the problem of me keeping myself is it takes constant vigilance. Sometimes, sometimes people find it hard to sleep at night because. They're trying to take care of their problems. They're trying to figure it out themselves instead of trusting God with it. But God who keeps his children, he never slumbers. He's never tired. He never gets sleepy on the job. You and I can rest and know that God watches over us. Our God never sleeps. He always watches over his children. And in Psalms 4, 8, the scripture says, I will lay me down in peace. Oh, I tell you, we live in a world today that doesn't have peace. But the child of God, the believer in the Lord, those that trust in God and his word and fear the Lord, they lay down in peace and they sleep. For you, O Lord, only make me dwell in safety. David was saying, God, I, I have peace and I can sleep well because I know, Lord, that you watch over me and keep me and I dwell in the safety of an all-seeing, all-knowing God that created heaven and earth. We need to put our full hope and confidence in God today. When your trust is in the Lord, you'll never be disappointed. Man will disappoint. Sometimes we fail ourselves. Uh, the government sometimes can't help. Things don't work out. Plans of man fall apart. But we can trust the Lord. And when it comes to tough times, 
we can still have peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding because our heart and mind is stayed on the Lord, the scripture says, and we can rest, we can sleep because we know God's watching us. And then verse four, uh, David, he uh, repeats that. He said, behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber or sleep. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says about his own life writing to Timothy, For this cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, or I am not disappointed in the Lord, it means. For I know whom I have believed. Paul had great confidence, like David had great confidence, like you and I can have great confidence. We can know the one in whom we believe. And... Uh, and persuaded, Paul said, he was persuaded that the Lord is able to keep that which he had committed unto the Lord against that day, against that final day. How much of your life have you really committed to the Lord today? How much of your life do you take before God before you make decisions or choices? Do you trust God with your finances? Do you trust God in your marriage, relationships? How much of your life have you really committed to God you know, I think sometimes we try to hold things back. You know, I'm fully convinced God in his wonderful patience and mercy and kindness deals with us and works with us. But the truth is God wants a 100% commitment. He wants people that are all in. He must be Lord of all or not Lord at all. And I think that's uh, something we need to consider. Are we fully persuaded that God can take care of my life as I've committed to him even in this difficult time. Verse 5, uh, David said, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade upon your right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil, and he shall preserve your soul. That was verses 5, 6, and 7. The NIV says in that last part that the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord watches faithfully over his children. God protects his children. He provides for his own. God is a heavenly father, and he's much better than any earthly father could ever be. We can trust the Lord. We can believe God to watch out over us and preserve us from all evil. Preserve our soul. Take care of us. Verse 8 says, The Lord shall protect you, and you're going in, and you're going out from this time forth and forevermore. God is able to protect you. The word preserve there means to guard, to keep, to observe, to give heed, to charge, uh, to keep watch, and to ward off and protect and save life. It means that God is a watchman, that he waits and he observes and he sees what's going on in your life. He's watching ahead of you. He has a plan to preserve you. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. God knows what way we should go, how we should live, what we should do, what we should choose. We just need to trust the Lord today. God has given us wonderful promises in his word, and we can depend upon those promises. I want to read this first part again in Psalms 121. I will lift up my heels, my eyes to the hills. I will focus on God above from where, from where my help comes. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We can trust God that made heaven and earth tonight. We can believe that he's going to watch over us even during these uncertain times. Amen. I want to pray for you, and then I'm going to, I got something else I want to tell you when I'm done. But right now, if you're fearful, if, if you're not sure about what's going on in your life and, and you're anxious, I want to encourage you. Ask God to help you learn to trust him more. I think it begins in learning the word and in prayer and and, and learning to think differently, quit focusing on the problems and start focusing on the Lord. And maybe you're listening tonight, you don't know Christ as your Savior. And I encourage you just to simply uh, acknowledge who he is. Do you believe that Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, and that he bodily arose from the dead on the third day? You see, he came and died for you and me. And the Bible says that we will believe in the heart and confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we can be saved. And it's not just a mere statement. That believing there means a life change, a life surrender. I believe, so then I obey and follow after the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. We can, we can depend upon you. We can lean upon you. We can take your promises in the word of God, and we can make those our own. 
a love letter from you to your children, Lord, and your promise of preservation and protection and help. We thank you for that in the Word. Lord, I pray for those dealing with anxieties and fears and uncertainties, Lord. I pray tonight that they'll just lay those things down. And, and Lord, that they'll just look to you. They'll stop focusing on the problems, but start focusing on your promises, your word, God. They'll begin to pray and keep their mind fixed upon you and dwell on you and your promises, your word, God. Lord, I, I pray that they would fill their mind with uh, biblical things, with good Bible teaching on TV or the internet, watching Facebook services and, and other uh, media outlets. And then, Lord, I pray for those maybe that are uh, don't know you today. And I just offer up this prayer. If you want to accept the Lord, pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and I need your help. I believe that you rose from the grave victorious, over death, hell, and the grave. I believe, Lord, that you alone can save me, and I'm going to trust you alone. Not my good works, not church membership, but trusting you alone to forgive me and come in my heart and be Lord of my life. I believe you heard my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer tonight, please let me know. I've got some resources I want to get to you through the internet to help you 30-day devotional track that'll uh, it'll be a blessing to you amen now in just a few minutes uh, we're going to go in the other room and we're going to go on a zoom call with our church members and, and we're going to have prayer and if you've got a prayer request i encourage you to uh uh you know this to send that in the comments or private messenger to me uh and and we'll pray for your need tonight we're going to be praying for about an hour or so. We're going to be praying and, and uh, praying against this COVID-19 virus and uh, praying for people that are suffering and the losses of lives and uh, praying for healing and the cure. Uh, and we'd be glad to pray for you during this time as well. So please send in your, your prayer requests. And uh, another thing, churches are going to start opening up soon, and I think that's a wonderful thing. But I encourage you. Uh, when you go to church to practice the social distancing, to, to keep a distance from other people. It's a good idea to wear a mask and, uh, uh, you know, to, to be respectful of other people. Some people are perfectly okay. Uh, they're not the least bit concerned, but there are people who are concerned. So we want to be a good neighbor. We want to love our neighbors, our friends. And so we want to respect others by giving them proper distance, by obeying the rules every Church will probably have some guidelines for you to follow, and I encourage you to follow those guidelines. Uh, our church, we're blessed here. We have quite a bit of room, so we're taking chairs out, and, and we'll have a minimum of six foot, but I believe eight foot distancing between all of our little groups of chairs for uh, individuals and couples and families to set in so that there's plenty of room for everybody. I think it's important during this time that we think about other people that we be patient, and uh, maybe you'll go to church and, and they'll take your temperature. Uh, well, just let them, it's no big deal, especially if they've got a thermal thermometer, they don't even touch you, they just point the thing at your forehead. Uh, just let them do that. If you don't have a mask, then maybe, some, maybe they'll have masks for you if they ask you to wear them, wear them. Uh, consider other people during this time. I think it's important also as believers during this time that we post good godly stuff on Facebook. There's so many wonderful things to be said about how good our God is, miracles that he's done, testimonies of people, scriptures that we can put up, uh, that we don't want to get caught up in all the, the fussing and the politics of what's going on. Let's just use Facebook as a way to love people and share the good news of Jesus. Well, God bless you. I want to remind you in the morning, 1030 a.m. Central Time, uh, we'll be back here, Facebook Live. And then next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, May the 24th, we'll have our first in-house service. Uh, and we're looking forward to that too. God bless you and good night.